This is Abu Sakara's take on agriculture in Ghana with a focus on soil and not oil. I'll be speaking to two eminent persons who have been at the forefront of Ghana's development at different levels. Uh, we have with us Dr. Nimoy Thompson, the Director General of the National Development Planning Commission. Uh, he is an economist, a world-renowned economist, and also an ardent believer in a homegrown economy. We are, have also with us uh, Mr. Sam Asanti Mensa, who is a development specialist. He's worked with Adventist Relief Agency. Uh, he's the director for food security. And I believe he will bring significant insights into the role agriculture has played in rural livelihoods and transforming incomes and bettering the lives of people, along with the big macroeconomic picture that Dr. Nimoy Thompson will paint for us, which will situate us as which will situate us not only in terms of absolute amounts of growth, but relative amounts of growth in terms of our agricultural trade in the world, uh, how we're progressing in terms of the composition of contribution to various uh, components of our agricultural trade, and also looking within the economy uh, where we have significant overlaps between agriculture and other sectors and where we can tweak the various interventions and initiatives that we have made to give us a bigger impact of agriculture on our economy. So let's say welcome to Dr. Nimoy Thompson. And good to you see doing? you again, good my too. good comrade. Yeah. And uh, Sa Asante Bensa, yeah. uh, it's a pleasure talking to you. I heard you've just come from Saboba, a long uh, distance away. A long way from so home. We want to console with you on the hard road. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, infrastructure is a very important part of agriculture. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in exactly. terms of reductions in transaction costs, etc., access to markets. So let's start there, basically. Uh, our share of agriculture, uh, agricultural trade in the world, and uh, the composition of it in Ghana and its impact on our economy mm -hmm. throughout the ages. Dr. Nimoy Thompson, you are a a renowned economist. This is your area. Mm -hmm. What is your take on this? Well, thank you very much for having me on the program and choosing a very timely topic. Uh, in terms of our share of agriculture and global trade, it's fractional, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, insignificant, relatively speaking. And even where it is significant, agriculture in the sense of cash crops mm -hmm. in this case that would be cocoa shea butter and, and a few other things but perhaps the focus really should be on the dynamics of the sector itself mm -hmm. production issues of self-sufficiency uh issues of structural shares and so forth and so on of course over the past decade or so the share of agriculture broadly as as uh, part of total economic output has been declining mm -hmm. as recently as 2005 or thereabout, it was around 40%. As we speak, it's hovering around 20%. It's not necessarily a bad thing. People tend to think, oh my God, the share of agriculture is declining and therefore the sky mm -hmm. must be caving in. Look at Germany, the share of agriculture is just around 1%. Mm -hmm. And yet they're able to feed themselves. It's roughly the same for most of the mm -hmm. industrialized countries. So it's not so much the share. It's that low in those countries because services mm -hmm. also then expand even though in absolute terms, agriculture may be expanding. So we expect that the 22% will actually continue to, de to decline further as other services uh, arise or as the economy itself matures and becomes somewhat more modern. And let me explain services. But before here. you do that, mm -hmm. uh, there is the issue that, you know, we used to be a world leader. Everybody likes to be a world leader. In we were a world leader in cocoa production. Mm -hmm. uh, our palm oil was not too significant, but it was not bad. Now we're a net importer of palm oil. Mm -hmm. So we've gone down a step or two. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many Ghanaians who are perhaps a bit older than you and mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. uh, will be reminiscing mm -hmm. of these old times when we were somewhere, but yes. now we're not there anymore. Well, economic structures change. Once upon a time, RCA television sets were the rage and they were pro produced almost entirely in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Today, they don't produce a single television set in the U.S. But the economy has, in fact, it's the biggest, about 15, 14 trillion U.S. dollars, the biggest in the world. So the, 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 the shifting nature of production is part of the whole process mm -hmm. of development. In fact, you mentioned cocoa and palm oil. Before cocoa, palm oil 
was actually the leading uh, uh, foreign exchange in palm oil and cola nuts and so forth and so on. So perhaps we should focus more on, on our ability to grow the sector, make it sustainable, and ultimately promote both food and nutritional uh, self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. That's where the focus should be. And that will come around or come about as a result of one, uh, increasing the levels of investments across the sector, and by extension, uh, being more efficient and therefore raising yield or productivity in there. And these, these are the areas where we've had uh, various challenges. You mentioned earlier the issue of budgetary allocations mm -hmm. to the sector, and I joke that, well, it depends on where mm -hmm. you look in the budget. Several years ago, we did some study on CADIP, uh, I believe, um, and it turned out that it was a bit wrong to just look at budgetary allocations going to MOFA, Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Mm -hmm we had to look at all the research institutions that work in agriculture, and money is going to those sections. We even had to incorporate spending from the Ministry of Roads and uh, Highways because they also uh, handle um, feeder roads, which also contributes to agriculture. So the investment is kind of spread across some uh, ministries, but there's the general belief, yes, if you look, for instance, at the data from the central bank mm -hmm. on outstanding credit mm. from the major banks, the, uh, what they call the deposit money banks. The share of agriculture definitely is very low, if you look at it from that aspect. And it gives you a sense of the potential, the room for even more action for us to in invest. It. But I, I have to emphasize that investing is just one aspect of it. We need to be also more efficient, for instance, expanding and developing the value chains. You look at rice value chain, for instance, it tends to be very cramped. Mm. Uh, sometimes the same family or, or unit preparing everything, growing everything, milling everything, bagging everything, transporting. Uh, so it's, it's cramped. Whereas we need to expand that. Agreed. Uh, yeah. Agreed. We'll, c we'll come to those details and I'll move over to Professor mm. Asante when we come to those details. But I think the last point that mm. I just want you to, to tease out for us is basically, you know, you mentioned about the way the budget is calculated, mm -hmm. an agricultural share of the budget. Uh, some people would say that, you know, the Maputo Declaration brought about ingenious ways mm -hmm. of uh, calculating mm -hmm. the agricultural budget mm -hmm. in order to meet the 10%. Right, and therefore, right. all other things were thrown in. Right. And overnight, people who had only 2.5% exactly, exactly, suddenly got exactly, more than 10%. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but when you look at the budget in mm -hmm. terms of the capacity mm -hmm. of one, MOFA officials in the field mm -hmm. to move into rural areas to mm -hmm. provide that timely advice and technical information. Right, right, right. Uh, that's not so good because, you yes. know, uh, we have salaries, composition, yes, component, yes, yes. and beyond that, very little for operations. Uh, that, and that is where many of the donor organizations yes. come in to supplement. Yes. Uh, and that is why when you look at our budget to a large extent, you see that there's a significant contribution yes, yes. from donors yes. to operationalize. Yes. But of course, when you have somebody operationalizing, yeah, yeah, yeah. then your, the direction towards your target and your plan may not be so focused. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sandy, what do you have to say about this? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> if, if we would even add what is contributed by donor communities through, through NGOs, mm -hmm. we will see that the budget for agriculture could be more than what we see now because um, Donor communities pass a lot of funds through okay. NGOs, yeah. which eventually get to the farmers mm. and contribute to expanding agriculture. Mm. I think this aspect must be captured mm -hmm. and added to it. Mm. Yes. Mm. But beyond that, you know, there, there's the claim that, yeah, as much as that is happening, what is the context within which these funds are being used? Are they being used in the context of some comprehensive development plan for agriculture? Or are uh, each, each of the donors and NGOs and uh, organizations pursuing their specific interests, which may be good, but then in terms of transforming the economy, it doesn't have that desired impact. But Dr. Nima, what well, is your I, take I, I, on I, this? I, well, I'll key in on the word you used uh, in terms of transforming the economy. Yes. Because if, if you follow the news, the president uh, late last year, specifically December 4th, uh, presented his transformation agenda. The coordinated, the official name, is the coordinated program for the economic and social policies, uh, development policies mm -hmm. of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And the subheading uh, is 
an agenda for transformation. Mm -hmm. It actually revolves around ag agriculture, the, 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 what they call platforms mm -hmm. for transformation. And it looks at all these crops mm -hmm. that we can use as a basis, at least in the short term, for transforming the sector, including processing and so forth and so on, especially agro-processing. So not just primary agriculture in terms of improving yields and so forth and so on, but also processing them into fruit juices and so forth, dried fruits and ex exporting them. So at least we're moving in that direction. The challenge will come when we begin to make investments. And I'm glad you, you frame the, the problem in a way that's very familiar with a lot of players in the sector where uh, more often than not, a substantial or disproportionate part of the budget tends to go to recurrent expenditures like uh, uh, the wage bill and administration and so forth and so on, and not too much going into uh, the, the capital, the investment aspect of it. And I had a, a personal experience several years ago, about 10 years ago, when we went to one of the districts to actually study the agricultural uh, setup there. And it was clear the people were getting paid all right, but they didn't have the facilities to work with. There was the instance of an extension officer for a couple of them who couldn't go out into the field because there, was no, there were no vehicles to, to use. They, they had requested motorcycles, but the motorcycles hadn't come in yet because the budgetary allocations had not been released yet. And so he had to use public transportation. He had to go to, to the uh, center of town and wait in a lorry, public vehicle, until it was full before he could go to the farming community. Typically, before he, when he got there, he had about two or three hours to work because he had to come back. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they were, so these are some of the hidden issues that we really need to bring up mm -hmm. beyond the figures. What is happening out there? There are major structural yes. problems that we need to, and, and it, they are all listed in the transformation agenda. How we, we have to remove those bottlenecks. And then, lastly, you you talked about uh, planning, and I thought of. The, the, some of the other structural aspects also. You, you, you've traveled obviously around the world. You've seen how typically a lot of farms are very close to highways. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is on, on purpose. It's, it's not an accident that from farm straight to a highway. Mm -hmm. We unfortunately have this situation where a lot of the farms are in the forest. Mm -hmm. And even where they were closer to uh, settlements, mm -hmm. we, we then take over the farmlands. And then the the farms move further and further away. There's no plan and so forth and so on. It's also a reflection of the absence of spatial development uh, uh, planning framework over, over the past uh, 30, 40 years. We are now trying to bring all those back so that as we go on the next 10, 15 years, there should be some sanity in spatial planning where you know that, okay, this is a farm. What is the quickest way to get the produce from the closest market? If it's 15 miles away versus, let's say, just a, a couple of kilometers near settlements, there are obviously cost implications by the time they get to uh, market, by the time people buy them or you export them. So it's a whole uh, a range of issues. And then lastly, the issue of uh, um, logistics, uh, val not just value chains as I described them earlier, but in terms of storage and transportation and so forth. Those are all things, they're all spelled out yeah. in, in the transformation yeah. agenda. Mr. Asante, this is an area which you are living day in, day mm. out mm. In, in rural <laughs> development. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it is clear that farmers live and farm in villages. Mm. So essentially, farmers farm mm. where they live. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so uh, may, bearing in mind these challenges that uh, Dr. Nimoy Thompson has outlined, in your programs and in your interventions, uh, how do you take this on board and how do you dovetail that into what the context of the national development is? I think in the, in the first case, if you look at Ghana, land ownership is something that significantly affects agriculture. Yeah. The fact that government itself does not own lands. Mm. And so when it comes to zoning mm -hmm. agricultural lands, government has little, I would say, clout. Mm -hmm to kind of, let's say, zone this area um, for this crop or that crop. It's mostly in the of hands course, of the chiefs. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, broadly, government can recommend through uh, recommendations from Soil Research, Crop Research Institute that this area is good for this or that. But because the people own the land, the chiefs and the people own the land, it's difficult to, let's say, uh, uh, completely dedicate an area for that. So people live, uh, people farm where they live. 
And we have to adjust ourselves to suit the present uh, situation. And that means making sure that the, the staff you work with are provided with vehicles or motorbikes so that they can reach the people. Of course, also, it's important to look at what approaches to extension you are using. Where you are working in a scattered area, is it possible to organize the farmers into groups? Mm -hmm. For example, we have been using the FBO or farmer based organization approach, which works. It will, be, it will work if the extension officer is also facilitated so that he can get to the groups and he's able to work with a large number of people at a time. So looking at these things, there is, there is where, where it's possible when it, when it comes to uh, let's say government owning lands. I know maybe this approach may not be be uh, what government may be interested in. But I think that in some countries, like in some countries like Mozambique, where the land is owned by the state, you, it's a matter of uh, the state uh, declaring that this area, we are going to support this kind of crop in this area. And efforts are put in there, and that works. But in our case, as I said, where the land is owned by people and by chiefs, we can only look at the situation and try to, to influence it. Okay, so we have this dichotomy between what the National Development Plan is yes. and what it translates to on the ground yeah. based on constraints with land ownership for exactly. one. Uh, of course, there's an the issue as well of interests of various actors trying to toe the line with that. Uh, but there's also the issue of people appreciating uh, the uh, strata of different kinds of agriculture going on. Right now, from our discussion, what is emerging is that yes, there is a large commercial scale agriculture which you can position where you want. Exactly. And then our dominant agriculture is by small scale farmers, mm -hmm. which happens where people live. Yeah. And the constraints of the two are slightly different. Uh, one is constrained uh, by location mm -hmm. uh, and the logistics, even just farm roads. Yeah. Uh, many people do not know that the fufu, the banku, uh, the, the, the plantain that you eat, the first five kilometers of its journey from a farm, it is carried by women and children yeah. on their heads. 90% yeah. of what yeah. we eat. Yeah, and it is carried along a bush track road, yeah. mm -hmm. which comes yeah. from the fields mm -hmm. to the homestead. Yeah. That is before we even stopped, start talking about yeah. getting into the first rural markets. Yeah. And you can imagine yeah. the distances that are covered yeah. back and forth. Yeah. You're talking of hundreds of kilometers just to get a harvest home. Okay. And that is after a full season's yes, work. Yes. So these are the areas where you know, some interventions, strategic interventions, yeah. Yeah. can take place. Yeah. The construction of farm track roads, exactly. especially by DCEs, exactly. who could use some of their common fund for exactly. this. Uh, but be that as it may, yeah. I think right now uh, what is clear is that we have different kinds of agriculture, mm -hmm. but we also have the transition from the small to the medium scale. And over the years, uh, Dr. Nimoy Thompson, government has tried various initiatives at transforming the agriculture, modernizing the agriculture, the, whatever words you want to use. Mm -hmm. It wants to advance the agriculture from that small uh, subsistence scale to you know, a modern, you know, what I would say, uh, business-oriented yeah. agriculture. Uh, why has this not been as successful? Because we've had the colonial period where we had plantation crops. Uh, then we had the uh, pre-independence period, uh, the independence period, where we had our famous, uh, you know, uh, farmers brigade farms, uh, and then state even farm. after yeah, the state farms, farms. Yeah. and even after that, uh, we had the uh, Operation Feed Yourself initiative, presidential mm -hmm. initiative. Uh, we had one on the uh, during the Kufo regime uh, with uh, cassava processing yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. other crops, mm -hmm. uh, and then even uh, during this. Uh, Mills, Bahama administration, we've had the block farms and the buffer stock. Uh, the question is, having had all of these, has agriculture really transformed? Are we still in the same stage? And what are the intentions now, the, this, the real concrete plans now to move that forward? But perhaps you can 
you can amplify a bit on what people mean by modernization of agriculture, mm -hmm. Dr. Nimoy Thompson. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you learned about that because there's, there's some misconception mm -hmm. about that very term, modernization. Mm -hmm. In the past, we tended to look at modernization as being synonymous with mechanization. Mm -hmm. And so we imported a lot of tractors that we couldn't maintain. They, 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 some of them were given to us on soft uh, terms by quote-unquote donors who on the surface they looked like they were doing us a favor but actually trying to export these things we couldn't maintain them they used also as uh, 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 gimmicks to try and do that so that kind of faded away but these days we have a much broader perspective of what we mean by uh, modernization which is not well mechanization may be one aspect one of, it, of it but yeah. high yields and yeah. so forth and so on uh, practices farming practices and so it's forth. It's basically to get a competitive agriculture. Exactly. And all the things that go with it. Yeah. Yes. To, to, to yeah. Go. But also the role of infrastructure, because I was looking at the situation in Liberia and what they did after the war, where the government actually gave it, because a lot of the rural areas more or less got depopulated during the Civil War. And one way of getting them back was to pro provide them with free uh, seedlings for rice and so forth and so on. The first year worked very well, but the next year they realized a, uh, a precipitous fall in production. And it turned out that it, it was a question of roads, access. They had the rice all right the previous year, but they, they made losses because they couldn't get it to uh, uh, the nearest market. So it shows the interrelated nature of, of these things. That Once you're working in one area, you need to bear in mind that everything ultimately relates to everything. You can have the highest uh, productivity on the farms. If they're not getting to where they should be, then it's just a question of people uh, losing interest in going into other things okay in terms of scale we would I like to take a short sure, break no now problem, and no then problem. come back later okay so we are still watching the take with abu sakara foster and uh, we'll be coming back to uh, pick up where we left off on this issue of turning our comparative advantage into ag in agriculture into a competitive advantage because that is the real essence of modernizing our agriculture thank you very much Welcome back to The Take. We'll continue with this issue of how we turn our natural resources, our soil, our ecology, uh, how we turn that comparative advantage into a competitive advantage in the marketplace. In other words, we're not looking at just the production aspects of it. We're talking about the human resource capacity building that needs to go with it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the infrastructure that needs to go with it. We're talking about the, 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 the marketing strategies, the value addition that needs to go with it, before we can turn this production into money in the marketplace, bearing in mind that we are not the only ones in the world. Other people are doing the same. But at the same time, we must take into consideration that many of the farmers producing crops are actually producing them to eat, and it is the surplus that they sell. So the food security aspect of it is very important, and we shall also come back to that uh, uh, as well. But let's go back uh, one step, uh, Dr. Nimo. Yeah. So you continue from where yeah. we left off, and then we yeah, come to Dr. Asante. Then going to touch the, on the turning that competitive, uh, that okay. comparative advantage yes. into a competitive advantage yes. in the yes. marketplace, yes. bearing in mind that we have an ocean here, mm -hmm. and it is cheaper to land food from other places here mm -hmm. than to bring them 100 kilometers away. Yes. Yes. In land. So uh, uh, obviously, it goes back to the heart of the transformation agenda or the strategy that you you, you talked about, uh, and within that uh, transformation agenda and its embedded strategy, we need to obviously focus a lot on ways of uh, containing or reducing cost. Mm -hmm. That will give us a competitive advantage that you are talking about. But I've, I have a feeling, at least through casual observation that the process of transformation itself in the agricultural sector in terms of moving from primary agriculture to some degree of processing has begun even though at a low intensity. Because mm -hmm. if you go to some of our local markets, you realize that there's a fair amount of processing going on. We are now packaging, there's now equipment and kukunte and fufu mm -hmm. and all those things. Mm -hmm. They're happening. And you see that they, these are happening at the early stages. But so they complain that the transaction costs are too high. That's why I said. Electricity bills exactly, are too high. Exactly. Doom so, doom so yes. is too often. No question about that. Yes. No question. At least the effort is now being made. Mm -hmm. And we are identifying the bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. from, from a policy point of view, now we need to zero. I personally want, uh, want us to actually engage them. 
mm. because long before I became DG for NDPC, I'd observed that. Mm. And I always felt good. There's a supermarket at Achimota that I go to now and then. There were entire shelves mm. made up of Ghanaian products. Mm. Ikwigwe, I mean, uh, Tom Brown and mm. so forth. For food. Uh, for everything. Food. Yeah. Yes. The only problem is the packaging. And yeah. we are actually looking at that in, within the context of our medium-term development plan, where we are talking about logistics, mm. the development of the logistics mm. sector, which in Ghana is severely underdeveloped. It's but also advertising, because you know, uh, you have very beautiful adverts with people smelling rice, mm -hmm. uh, but when the local farmer produces yes. this rice, yes. he puts it in a brown bag. Exactly. Package, you know, By the, under the uh, mango tree. No, no, no. We need to engage them, and it's actually part. Yeah. There's a, a, a number of key constituencies in the economy that we're actually planning mm. to engage. We also need to hear from them. Because mm. as, as I said, for me, it was a casual observation. Mm. We also do hear about cause, but it will be good to actually hear from them what is going on. Mm. Packaging for me is a, is a major mm. part. Mm. Uh, because sometimes, let's, let's face it, you may have a very crappy product, mm. but the packaging alone can get you a good market. Mm. And you may have a very good product, but the packaging alone will give you a very poor uh, market. I have a friend. Uh, actually has an MBA from the mm. States. He works with one of the financial institutions here in Ghana. But he also went into farming. He mm. started uh, farming rice. And he gave me some, a big bag of his. Mm. It's so delicious. I couldn't believe it. Mm. I mean, you can virtually eat it raw without stewing up. <laughs> it tastes great. Yes. So I'm perfume rice. Uh, yes. Which I, we grow here. It was great. In fact, I grow some myself. Yeah. I still <laughs> have. Oh, you do? Yes. So every time I want food, I ask my, my wife, uh, uh, do you still have some of Desmond's rice there? Yes. That's yes. the one I want. Fantastic. So it's, it's, so it's we, happening. It's happening. Uh, but we need to engage more and yes. make sure that it's institutionalized yes. and given much, much more of a strategic purpose Excellent. for every, everyone. Good. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Santi, yeah. this needs to happen also in rural areas, exactly. in cottage industries, yeah. in different products. Yeah. Uh, how do you see, you know, this emerging issue uh, in Ghana, and how can, would it, can it be accelerated? Because we're always talking about providing an enabling environment. Yeah. But I think we want to go beyond enabling and talk about empowering. Mm -hmm. What do you see happening in the, in the field? Good. I think in recent times we've been talking more about the market driving production. Mm. Mm. Years gone by, farmers would produce the crop, and then hope that somebody will buy. Mm -hmm. But in the last, I would say in the last six years or so, the term value chain, marketing approach, mm -hmm. have now become common parlance in, uh, among, uh, in the area of agriculture. So what, what I think we really need to do is to look at getting the markets to drive production. We in Ghana have had a model for a very long time. That's the cocoa model. Because of the demand abroad for Ghana's cocoa, farmers can produce and not even worry about how to market it. If we could apply the same approach to any crop, any agricultural enterprise, where we get the market to drive the production, if it's perfume rice as a uh, Doc is saying, if there is a demand for it, the other things that are needed can be put in place quickly. Mm -hmm. Production is here, the market is here. Mm -hmm. In between the two, the value chain is there. Mm -hmm. We look at what can we do to present it in the best form so we will not only be, uh, we will not only have a comparative advantage, but really competitive. Mm -hmm. In such a way that we can compete growing rice in Ghana with Vietnamese farmers or Thai farmers. We have to look at how we can bring down our costs, increase our productivity, and then also look at what the market wants. And then we'll make it. I'm glad you've, you've, you've come to this point, because clearly with more than almost one billion mm. being spent on rice importation, yes. and a deficit of almost 40% yeah. in terms of our yeah. consumption of rice, this is, the market is here. Yeah. Secondly, it's not just rice. Yeah. We have sugar cane, yes. also in, uh, or sugar, sugar in yeah. excess of also 600 million yeah. per annum. Yeah. These are all large chunks where our foreign earnings go outside every year. Then we have wheat. Mm -hmm. We all eat bread. Yeah. Of course, wheat is a, 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 temp, a, a temperate crop, temperate crop even yes. though it's been adapted and that there's some to subtropical some, yeah, areas. You know, uh, wheat. We can never really be competitive yeah. in growing wheat. Yeah. So that one we'll leave aside. Mm -hmm. But sugarcane, yeah. 
we can grow here. We, we can. Uh, uh, rice, yeah. we can grow yeah. here. The market yeah. is here. Yeah. What is happening between production and the market yeah. that stops people from getting, uh, taking advantage of this? Because that is real income, and we have a lot of people unemployed. Yeah. What, in your opinion, is really the stumbling block? Good. Thank you. I think we can look at it from two points. First, let's look at a number of crops that for which there is a high demand. If you take soybean, there are companies in Ghana that are compelled to import soybean into this country. Uh, some in the Middle Belt, uh, some along the coast, some in Ashanti region using the soybean to make soy uh, oil and also a soy cake for the poultry industry. Why can't we produce more? If you look at the soybean and the way it's planted, it has to be planted very close to get high productivity. Go to the village. If you want to plant five acres, you need a whole village to line up and plant the crop, which makes it virtually difficult to expand. Because there are other production. uses of labor. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We have been talking about mechanization. Good. Mechanization in Ghana virtually stops at land preparation, yeah. plowing. Okay. What I think we need to do is to go a step further, bring in more planters, mechanize the planting, mechanize the harvesting, and then the rest will follow. But if we only plow the land, we may not even harrow, then obviously you, you cannot use a planter. That, that's good, but many people will say that, look, this kind of equipment is too much for the small-scale farmers. But there is also the initiative yes. where agri uh, they, they've put out about 72 agricultural mechanization centers. Exactly. Uh, even though that has come a bit static now, yeah. Mm. Yeah. but that is an area that we could push. Exactly, but that is what I'm looking at. when you look at the mm. diesel, yeah. The cost of diesel, and I'm going to go to Dr. Nimoy on this. Okay. When you look at the cost of fuel mm -hmm. for mechanization, yes, yes, yes. it's prohibitive mm -hmm. because you see, I myself, mm -hmm. as a social uh, enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, have a mechanization center. Mm -hmm. You charge, we used to charge about 40 CDs mm -hmm. per acre, yeah. and it stayed there for a long time okay. because you know the purchasing power was weak. Yeah. So I mean, the current fuel prices forced it to mm -hmm. go to 60 CDs mm -hmm. per acre. And immediately you see people slacking yes, off, yes, going yes. back to the handhold again. Yeah. Yes. That is loss of productivity yes, yes. in time yeah. and area. Yes. Now, uh, many countries, mm -hmm. you will see that the fuel component for agriculture, mm -hmm. there is a rebate mm -hmm. because the government, in its prices structure mm -hmm. for fuel, uh, not that government controls prices, mm -hmm. but through taxation, yes, yes. About 60% of that cost of fuel mm -hmm. is, is, is tax. Mm -hmm. And then they say, because you're going to produce something mm -hmm. that meets a common good, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to give you the rebate yes. uh, in fuel. Mm -hmm. That is one of the areas of re cost uh, reduction in transaction costs. Even transporting the goods, yes. again, mm -hmm. we have some, yes. you know, uh, cushion, as it were. Yes. But that is not the case here. Yes. And on top of that, you're having to purchase fertilizer at 10 times the cost mm. that the American farmer purchases it. Mm. You're purchasing insecticides at 10 times the cost that the American farmer cost. So mm. all of this is making us not so competitive. Mm -hmm. Where are the areas mm -hmm. that we have influence over mm -hmm. that we can support our farmers mm -hmm. deliberately yes. and not be shy yes. to say that, look, we want to empower our yes. farmers to be competitive yes. and we're going to do A, B, yes. C, D. Yes. In terms of you know, national development planning yes. and, and meeting these strategic initiatives, yes. reducing our expenditures on, mm -hmm. on food imports, mm -hmm. where are the tangible areas mm -hmm. where we, can, we yeah. can support? Well, there are so many approaches. One, I'm glad you kept using the term rebate as mm -hmm. opposed to direct subsidies. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, not that direct subsidies are, are bad. They are very powerful instruments for promoting social equity and so forth and so on. But because of weak institutions, mm -hmm. in Ghana over the years, they've kind of taken on a bad name. They've been abused, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But the, re the rebate system may be one way of approaching it and simply making sure that, well, if once there's evidence that you spent this with the 60 or, or 40 Ghana cities for this mm -hmm. thing, you get maybe half of it, if not more, mm -hmm. or possibly even all, because it's also a strategy. It could be a strategy for rural development and so forth and so on. So yes, 
the, the instruments are there. We need to build institutions. One approach that we've taken in the new uh, uh, development policy framework is to emphasize the role of institutions. And by institutions, we mean laws, policies, acts, regulations, finance. Uh, 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 finance, in fact, I was going to talk about <laughs> uh, uh, attitudes yes. and values, yes. cultural practices, cultural, the whole range of it have a very important uh, uh, role to play in promoting the fiscal aspects of development. In the past, we left out those soft issues and focused more on the hard issues. Let's give them equipment. Mm -hmm. Let's do this and that. But if the attitude towards using them is not really the best, then you're going to have problems. So it's a comp complete approach. You do the policies and so forth and so on, but also get people to appreciate these things. And then lastly, just to go back to a point you made earlier, the distinction between large scale and small scale. I know in the literature they do uh, contrast or compare countries like Japan mm -hmm. versus the U.S. The U.S., because of large tracts of land, they went for the tractor-based kind of thing, huge thing. Whereas in Japan, because of relative land scarcity, it's more uh, small scale mm. and very intensive, and, and yet somehow they managed to go around that. Basically, the lesson here is that let's also use our own unique cultural environment because uh, it, you take the issue of cocoa, for example, which they brought here and they found the right environment. The, the indigenous people themselves em embraced the crop. There was very little colonial active promotion of it. Once they saw that, hey, this thing is actually uh, very good. They started moving away from palm oil and yeah. cola and so forth and so on. So let's create those kinds of loops. There's a lot to learn from the past to, to move uh, things forward. But I remain hopeful. I think as we go around talking to people, listening to people talk, uh, and the whole range, um, the, the, is it the Christian Council of Ghana or National Council, the Christian Council of Ghana, they've been making some pronouncements on the future direction of the country. So we, we are definitely looking at that, and we want to incorporate this within a long-term a development policy framework. We don't want a situation where everything is short term. Uh, in Kumasi, they used to say shotanga, just show enough, that kind of thing. <laughs> you mentioned uh, 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 Operation Feed Yourself. Yeah. Operation Feed Yourself more or less fit into that mode. Yeah. It mobilized, it, it was a very powerful instrument for mobilizing people. It worked on a certain level in terms of boosting production. Exactly. But yeah. there have been questions about whether or not it contributed to productivity. Yes. And that l leads to the question of it, what do we do? What's the best strategy? If you want to in, uh, improve or increase food production, mm -hmm. do you support those who are already mm -hmm. in the business of producing food? Mm -hmm. Or do you then spread your resources all around and say, okay, let everybody produce? Because in Operation Feed Yourself actually led to an increase because people who were not farmers yeah. also joined yeah. in. Yeah. But in the end, output per person actually went down. Yes. Actually, this yes. is an important point mm -hmm. because, you see, productivity relates to output per unit area or per unit time. Yes. Uh, and that is important mm -hmm. as a measure of efficiency. Exactly. Uh, now, what people have been used to is expansion in area. Yes. Uh, when it is, oh, this year, I'm yes. going to open so many mm -hmm. acres. Yes. But actually, you may just be spreading your losses yes, yes, over yes. a bigger yes. acre. Yeah, yeah. So the concept of productivity yes, is yes. important. Yes. And Productivity I think versus production. Yeah, yeah, the the of distinction course. is critical. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you see. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an area where I believe that in the field of operation, yeah. uh, getting farmers to be more productive yeah. uh, through investments in technology is yeah. one thing. Yeah. Uh, carrying that, that productivity gain mm -hmm. across the value chain to markets to then realizing income is another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the crucial part of this is financing the investments that go along with yes, it. Yes, yes. And you know, as I know, yeah. that you know, finance reaching rural areas is a problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if Sikaya Moja, mm. then some people are not getting the Moja. <laughs> so how can you expect them to be more productive? Uh, we have a situation, <laughs> contradictory situation, mm. where we have a policy on rural banks. Mm -hmm. And yet all the big accounts for salaries, mm -hmm. etc., are mm -hmm. still going through commercial banks mm. and the private banks. Mm. And they expect the rural banks mm -hmm. to work with just small, you know, rural market Micro, women, right, etc., right, right. and survive on that. The mm. liquidity is very low. Yes, yes. So even at the national policy level, mm. we are not driving investments okay. and okay. financing mm. into agriculture preferentially. And that is a problem. Mm. Uh, the whole issue of, you know, a special lending window mm -hmm. for agriculture. Mm. Agriculture is not a business 
where you can go to Dubai and come back two weeks, you turn over. <laughs> You're locked in it yes, for yes. about three months. Yes. With high risks. Risk. Yes. 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 And this is a big issue mm. because people are saying that unless and until mm. government, central bank, mm. allows a special window mm -hmm. for lending in agriculture and the flows in agriculture reach the farmers, mm. there will be no real productivity yeah. increase because the investments to come along with it Mm -hmm. will not be there. Mm -hmm. First, I'll go to you, and then over to you, on the yeah. same issue, yeah. Mr. Mensa. Yeah. I, I think agricultural credit is, yeah. is a big headache for farmers. That is, accessing credit is a big headache. But we also know that in the past, repayment mm -hmm. of credit, as far as farmers are concerned, has not been very good. That depends on how it is given. If you of give it course. at election time, it won't oh. be good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but also the risk, the inherent risk. We, no, no, we, we talked risk. about uh, the need for yeah. Yeah. Uh, insurance yeah. in yeah. the sector. Yeah. 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 The risk Carry on. Yes. Yeah. So the inherent risk is high. Mm. Fortunately, something is happening on the agricultural landscape. Mm. Agricultural insurance okay. has emerged. Okay. Uh, in the north, mm. uh, there's this Ghana agricultural insurance uh, program okay. that is funded by a, a consortium of insurance companies. Okay. And how, uh, what percentage of farmers is that covering? Uh, no, it's not, it's not it's that new, much, but it's, not much, okay. Yeah. it has okay. just begun. Yeah. Yeah. The idea, yeah, yeah, the yeah, concept yeah. is yeah. 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 And yeah. this is based on uh, weather, fa uh, mm. weather failure. Mm. Okay. Uh, okay. But I think as it grows, there, is, mm. there will be the need to expand it beyond just weather failure mm. to other okay. Um, mm. okay. uh, risks that mm. are embedded in agriculture. Okay. Mm. But that is the yeah. access side yeah. of it. Mm. Yeah. There is still the core issue of internal rates of return mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. enterprises in agriculture mm -hmm. being lower mm -hmm. than the increase in interest rates mm -hmm. uh, you know, that accrue yeah. yeah. from commercial money, yeah. which is borrowed, yeah. not mm -hmm. intended really for agriculture, yes, yes, yes. But, or adapted for use in agriculture, yes. but is used in agriculture. Yes. And that is a central issue. Yes. New, Dr. Nimoy Thompson, what's your take you, on that? You, you raise, yeah, now you've now elevated the debate from the micro, the yeah. what is happening to the macro and policy yeah. level. What, uh, what is the best uh, approach to do that? At the macro level, obviously, we must make, we, we must intensify efforts to, to generally reduce the cost of doing business in the country, whether it's agriculture or non-agriculture. We do know that the cost of doing business is very high by virtue of high interest rates which in turn uh, are somehow related uh, to uh, high inflation and so forth and so on. So we have that whole macroeconomic mess that we need to uh, untangle. And then, of course, there are policy initiatives. There's the IDIF, the uh, uh, Export uh, uh, and Agricultural Agri Development yes, Fund, yes, and so yes. forth and so on. It's relatively new, but I understand they made substantial uh, uh, loans out there. There's been some pause in the past two or three months to kind yes, of assess GCAP as well. I'm sorry? GCAP. Yeah, GCAP. Ghana yeah. Commercial Agricultural yes, Project. To yes. kind of assess yes. the yeah. efficacy of what they've done so far and expand that. But as we move forward, and the population is growing, I keep reminding people that between uh, 2000 and 2010, our population expanded by 6 million people. Wow. That's the equivalent of one Libya mm -hmm. with, without the corresponding resources. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, we're almost close to mm -hmm. the, producing just about another half uh, the number of people. So we need to feed uh, more mouths. Uh, we need to provide, of course, education and so forth and so on. That means we need to be more creative, more efficient and productive in the way we use resources. These are all been taken up at the policy level, and we are planning for it. But we are not just talking about plan in terms of the medium term. We think that's been part of the flaw, the strategic flaw over the years, where we focus just on medium to short term uh, frameworks. Two, uh, no, three, four years, three. It didn't give us that long-term perspective. Of course. We now want to actively promote that. And, of course, there is demand for that also. The, the, the public is now actually calling okay. for that. So we, we're going to move in that direction. We have to sure. take a break now. Okay. But I think it's a good point at which to take a break mm -hmm. because you've talked about medium versus long-term planning. Sure, sure. Uh, so when we come back from the break, we'll be looking at the fast step the uh, AGSIP, mm. the MetaSIP, yes. and all the other SIPs. It's not like Antarctic, <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> and the impact. Yeah. So we'll take a short break. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back to The Take. Uh, Dr. Nimoy Thompson, I'd like us to put 
the issue of financing to bed once and for all. Mm -hmm. Should we or should we not have a special lending window for agriculture, mm -hmm. bearing in mind that it, is, it has low rates of internal return compared to other commercial activities. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, it's premised on a, cro cro on a crop cycle or the life cycle of plants and animals. Mm -hmm and we're laden with so many risks, mm -hmm. and others do it, why can't we do it? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we do it? Mm -hmm. And you know, what are the other ways in which we might approach the problem? Mm. Well, as, as I said earlier, um, the issue of institutions, it's not so much the policy, but the institutions to, to drive the policies up towards. The issue of special windows of preferential lending to farmers, we've been through that it's from the 60s through 70s, and 80s, that's what Agricultural Development Bank uh, was actually set up initially to do. As we moved away from credit ceilings and uh, credit allocations and so forth and so on, we decided to bring in the rural uh, banks to do that. Again, weak institutions means, as you uh, alluded to earlier, means that the, 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 the anticipated impact wasn't quite what we have. These days we've introduced uh, IDIF to also help another. So we've, we've explored all these things. And one possible explanation for why these isolated interventions have not worked is that we have not looked at it in totality with other factors. So we may talk about finance, but then use the standard economics caveat that all things being equal, if you reduce the cost of credit, mm. it will enhance agriculture. But all things are not equal. So you may reduce the cost of credit below market rates, but other impediments may easily wipe out the benefit of credit. That's why we need to take a more comprehensive approach. What are some of the other issues? It may very well be that in some instances, or in some instances in terms of farmers' area or even crop, finance is not the issue. It's simply the mode of production. Someone brought a video to me uh, not long ago. He is into rice production, trying to in introduce technologies. And the video is actually split into two, where the first part is the current, quote unquote, primitive tedious way of producing the rice. One family, after they do their harvesting, they uh, smash the, the bushel on, yes, on, on rock and so yes, forth and yes. so on. And then he, the second part of the video is a much quicker way, using yeah. technology and so forth and so on. So if it turns out that this person who is threshing or whacking on this yeah. thing, their problem is technology, and you're giving them loans that are not really then you may actually end up throwing money down the drain. And there, a lot of it might have happened in the loan will be to invest in a threshing machine, which will make it quicker. If, if, well, if that is the case, yes. if that's, then you are looking at the whole range. And yes. even then, at the point is that, should they really be doing that? Or should we expand the value chain so that they only focus on growing the rice? Okay, Let yeah. that be Some somebody's point. business exactly. to come and okay. buy it, to go and mill it, okay. and then let somebody's business be to bag it and transport it exactly. from point A to point B, and then let someone go and buy it at wholesale and take it to Mokala or KJT and all that. We need to look at those Segmentation, things. Segmentation, specialization exactly. of roles and responsibilities, <laughs> choices of crops, some being more profitable than yeah. others. Yeah. But what's your take on yeah. the role that finance should play and can play yeah. in stimulating productivity at yeah. a grassroots level? I think, I think I agree with uh, mm. Dr. Thompson mm. yeah, that um, we have to look at how the credit is being applied. We have to look at the entire value chain. Mm. If you take the farmer end, we have to look at the factors that will result in high productivity. Sometimes basically it is just planting method. Mm -hmm. exactly. Increasing exactly. plant population mm -hmm. alone can increase the yield mm such that the farmer can utilize credit profitably. Yes, yes. So we have to look at each point in the value chain of the crop and look at and address the needs. If this, is, if this point where we need to put in a rice mill or a threshing machine, and even at that point, we have to make sure that the one who is taking the credit for the machine has enough farmers to service mm -hmm. so that uh, he is able to repay right. the credit. And that should be the case all along the chain. So we need to look at, at each point in the chain, from production to the consumer end. Mm -hmm. What is the problem? What is the challenge here? How do we address it? And then if it's that of credit, we put in credit, but alongside with uh, a package of technologies, information that will make the credit mm -hmm. um, profitable, mm -hmm. so that people can pay and the banks can run. 
Yeah. Mm. So basically, you're saying that, look, let the markets lead the way. Yes. Private sector is the engine of growth. Exactly. Uh, but people are saying that that is not enough because there are some market failures in rural areas. Yeah. Uh, the synchronization of all these actors at a particular location rarely happens. Mm -hmm. And what you find happening is that around the big provincial towns, you'll have all the services. And then as you go deeper into the bush, mm -hmm. where transaction costs are higher and people are making yeah. losses, where their farmers yeah. actually yeah. are, then the services stop. Yeah. So that puts a ceiling yeah. on how fast we can grow. Yeah. So bearing that in mind, yeah. what other interventions okay. can we take okay. to ensure that we deepen these services and go past the point where it is you know, commercially profitable okay. to, where the, to the point where farmers actually live and where those transaction costs are. And surely there must be some public good yeah. in doing this exactly. because it brings food cheaper to exactly. the table and it reduces the portion exactly. that poor people are spending, even urban people are spending on food, up yeah. to 60% of income spent on food. Yeah. That is if you have any yeah. money left after yeah. electricity yeah. bills. So this is an area which yeah. I think uh, in the scheme of things, yeah. are the number crunching, is the number crunching really perforating down to the rural level? What, what's yes. your take on I that? Think, I think we, we need to put in more effort in the provision of social services that would uh, complement what the farmers are doing. Yeah. Let's take, for example, rural roads. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm thinking that if every assembly mm -hmm. has a good uh, grader mm -hmm. and that can be fueled, mm -hmm. let's say even twice in a year, the grader regrades the roads to the villages and so on and so forth. These are the feeder roads. The feeder roads. Before we even talk of the farm track roads. Exactly. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we get this thing done. And this becomes something that is, I would say, religiously done every year to make sure that transportation is no more a challenge to the farmer. Then we can move on still to the farm tracks. But then somebody will argue that, yeah. look, you know, my DC was appointed by the president. He doesn't care what I think and what I want. Who is going to make him spend that common fund on those things that mean something to me? Because I'm not the one who is going to determine whether he comes or not. No, I think once the DC is, is under his big boss, the president of the country. Yeah. So if this becomes a national policy, I think that can be worked out right from the top. NDPC, if that, if that becomes one of the things NDPC wants to look at, I believe NDPC will be able to put in mechanisms that will ensure that these rural roads are graded because the uh, government has provided every assembly with a grader. That often sits in front of the Granted, hmm. but what better mechanism can they be when we're talking about agriculture being related to other institutions, etc.? What other better mechanism can they be than me voting my DCE out if he hasn't done the farm track roads. <laughs> <laughs> Nimoy Thompson. Well, it's, it's, it's a political economy <laughs> issue, obviously. But until we get to that uh, uh, ideal stage mm. of yeah. us having a say in who governs us at the local level, the existing law also makes it imperative for DCEs to actually involve the communities in planning, in, in local development planning. They are required. There's a law, Act of, of 480 actually requires that they should involve all the communities. That's one. The second level is that the local uh, plans should be aligned with the national uh, uh, development priorities. The only drawback, and NDPC is working on that now, is that we have no legal instrument to support us in enforcing that. Okay. As I speak with you, we have just finalized a legislative instrument. Mm -hmm. The Attorney General has just given her us her blessings mm -hmm. and it's now going it should be going to cabinet where we will now be able to actually monitor what the D, uh, the district assemblies and the MDAs are doing mm -hmm. and whether or not they're actually in line with prescribed mm -hmm. or stated national development objective mm -hmm. and if they are not now the uh, LI actually gives us the power to sanction them to impose administrative mm -hmm. sanctions mm -hmm. we never had that in the past hopefully by the time this year is over would have had that to address some of these issues in addition to having Act 480, which is the National Planning System Act. That's a big step forward. Sure, yeah. that would yeah. be a big step mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. because, you know, 
essentially the issue of having agroecological areas mm -hmm. within a, a certain national context mm -hmm. of where we want to get our agriculture to. Right. And then forcing spending mm -hmm. to support the right. interventions in right. those areas is right. important. Yes. But now, <coughs> the system as we have it, mm -hmm. uh, you have the district local governments, mm -hmm. uh, then you have the regional coordinating councils, mm -hmm. and then, you, of course, you have central government. Mm -hmm. Uh, many people would even argue mm -hmm. that that structure is not conducive mm -hmm. for you know, stimulating the rate of uh, development that mm -hmm. we want at mm -hmm. the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. I think we will be summarizing the issues that we've discussed mm -hmm. with a view that we're going to have a second session mm -hmm. in which uh, we will juxtapose uh, the potential mm -hmm. for income from oil versus the potential from income for agriculture. Mm -hmm and also the opportunities for employment it delivers. Mm -hmm. uh, given that we have talked about how we want to approach all these challenges mm -hmm. for agriculture to be also vibrant and kicking and efficient and higher in productivity, mm -hmm. then we can compare the two okay. and see why, where we can put our focus okay. and get the greatest returns to investment. Mm -hmm. I'll start with you, Dr. Nimoy Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, your 30 seconds mm -hmm. on a summary okay. of what has transpired mm -hmm. so far. Thank you, thank you. I think that's actually a creative choice of words, soil versus oil. <laughs> Just drop the S and you have the other. Fortunately, they are not mutually exclusive. Yes. You can pursue uh, both, in fact, uh, both oil and agriculture in some uh, discussions are considered, fall under the uh, rubric of, of, of natural resources. Mm. So it's just a question of how you, you utilize them. And in the case of oil, how you plow back some of the resources in there because there's always the fear that when you depend too much on, uh, on oil, agriculture tends to die, the yeah. sort of the famous Dutch disease and all that. Mm -hmm. But if you plan well by diverting some of the resources to mm -hmm. develop agriculture, I think you can overcome that. And we have that framework. We pro perhaps need within the next year or so to have some sort of uh, midterm or impact evaluation mm -hmm. to see how well it has worked so far. That should be, I'm, I'm glad that you asked the question. I'm, I'm glad that I've also pointed to that. <laughs> Maybe I'll put that in NDPC's work plan. Excellent. First to actually uh, have Excellent. some sort of an impact evaluation. Excellent, that's very, very, very interesting. <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Asante Mesa, yes. what uh, would be your closing remarks yeah. on the issues we've discussed so far uh, and setting a stage for our second take with Abu Sakara on developing agriculture focus on soil, not oil. Thank you very much. I think um, this has been a quite uh, an enlightening discussion. Um, we know that oil will not last forever, but the land will be there forever. Amen. <laughs> and uh, oil will support not as many people as the land will support. And so while the oil lasts, let us put some of the income from it in developing the basic infrastructure upon which we can build agriculture. All the way from uh, the land through mechanization, irrigation, all along the value chain, processing, storage, all the way. So that by the time the oil runs out, we would have built up a developed agriculture upon which the millions of people that are in it will be able to continue to make a living. Uh, we are now positioned uh, to look at the way forward, having identified the many complex and uh, challenges and their interplay, to look at the way forward in our next discussion when we come to discuss soil, not oil, Ghana's development in agriculture. Thank you very much, and thank you for being with us on Abu Sakara's take on agriculture.